Okay, so let us let us start. Okay, so first thing we want to discuss is the format of the exam. So after some initial consultation with a small sample of you, I sort of came upon this mode, which is that the exam should be closed notes and not open notes. Uh, you know, they, they, it's not fixed. I'm making a suggestion. The exam can be either closed notes, like you are, you are not allowed to consult anything, or it can be open notes, like you are allowed to consult your notes. Of course, the exam questions will become different if you have different choices. So, which one is preferred? Close. Closed notes is simpler than open. Open is much tougher exam, you know, generally. Closed notes, very good. Then the duration. Two hours is okay or three hours is desirable? How many questions do we have? How many questions That will depend on the time. <laughs> so, for one hour? No, no, no. Two hours is good. So, two hours closed notes. Uh, two hours is good, I think. Uh, because it's going to be a tough exam, so you know, you, if you only make it one hour, it will not work. Okay? No, it won't be tough, but you know, you should be, allow yourself a little bit of time. So, two hours, close notes. Then there was a question, should it be f five questions out of six or five questions out of five or six questions? Four questions out of four. Four questions out of five. Three out of three. <laughs> or I can do it like this. I can assign you six questions and do as many as you like. Of course, the credit you get is proportional to how many you do. So <laughs> it's always the same. So whether you say four out of five or five out of five, um, does not make so much difference. So which one do prefer, people prefer? Four out of five. Five out of six is what I like. Okay, I think uh, you, it gives you a little bit of choice, but it gives me a little bit of measure of how much you have learned, because you know I can also make it one out of two, and that is not discriminating enough. Okay, so it'll be five out of six questions written, closed notes, two hours. Okay, settled. Next thing. Uh, some previous difficulties, previous comments, we explain. Okay, one thing which uh, seems to have bothered people, sorry, uh, can you please be quiet? One question which seems to have bothered people is this problem about is the group over the set of recurrent states or is it over the set of operators? And what's the connection between these or what's the relationship? So for finite groups, there is no real problem. The group we defined was actually over the set of operators. There were these operators AI, you can multiply them. What you get is another operator. And the set of operators was only finite because some higher powers of the operators reduced to smaller ones. But suppose you have a set of operators GI, which form a um, closed set under multiplication. And then, I apply this g i on some vector psi. I get psi i. Okay? Now, if two different operators are applied to the same vector, I guess you should get different answers. Because the inverse exists. Okay? So, it is clear that the number of vectors is the same as the number of operators. Okay, so that should not cause. Uh, so, psi i are different, psi i not equal to psi j if g i, if i not equal to j. 
and that then there is no problem with the numbers. Okay. All right. So in the um, recap, so we discussed the number of recurrent states is equal to the number of operators. Then we said the matrix tree theorem. With, so this number of states was equal to determinant of delta set of recurrent states. But we said the determinant of delta is also the equal to the number of spanning trees on the graph, where the graph is understood as the graph of the lattice plus a sink site to which all the extra particles, if there are any which are lost, are added. Okay? And then you construct spanning trees on this graph, and that gives you the number of recurrent states. And then we pointed out that uh, this spanning tree problem is also related to the resistor network problem. And I didn't give a full proof of the Kirchhoff theorem, but stated it that you know the effective resistance is equal to number of spanning trees on some graph divided by number of spanning trees on a different graph where the different graph is obtained by taking the old graph and collapsing two sides and just making them into one. Yes. Sorry, if I come back to that point. Uh, um, you said that the, the number of operators is the same uh, as the number of states. Huh? Yeah. Because the number, there are a lot of states here. These are my states. One operator takes me to this one, one operator takes me to this one, one operator takes me to this one, like that. So for, for any starting reference state, you can construct one operator for each of the other states. So if I start from psi, there is an operator that will bring me anywhere in the set of yeah. states. Hmm. Okay. Okay. I guess it works for infinite, except you have to be careful in counting. Okay. The infinite dimensional one is a little bit of a problem because you should be sure somehow you haven't missed something. Here, the point about missing something is much more obvious and trivial. OK. So now, what we want to do is to make a more precise correspondence between the spanning trees and the recurrent configurations of a sand pile. So one to one So I take some lattice. We are always working with this sort of fiducial example. And uh, this is too big. I have a small lattice. Now I will add these extra links. And then there is this sink site outside. And I draw a spanning tree on this bigger structure. And um, then I draw a sand pile configuration. The number of possible sand pile configurations is equal to the number of spanning trees. So it is possible to make a one-to-one -one correspondence between these equal size sets. But we would like to make the correspondence in a way which seems natural. Okay? So is there a nice way to assign a tree to a configuration? So that you give me the tree, I will give you the corresponding sand pile configuration and vice versa. Okay? So how do, how do you do that? So the answer comes using the burning algorithm. U. 
tubes. So what we do is we start out with this lattice and let us say it has some heights 3, 3, 1, 2, 3, 0, 3, 2, 1, 0, 3, 3, 1, 2, 3. So what I do is I apply the burning technique per in parallel in one step. In the first step, I scan all the lattice and burn all the sites which I can burn. Then I go back and do it again. And then go back and do it again, step by step. So I come here. In the first step, this site can burn. So I just burn it. I imagine that the sink site is always burnt. You know, it is not there in my problem. So sink site is burnt. Then I burn this one. So the, if I say the fire from the sink will hit this and burn this one. Now it is burnt. Okay? This one will also get burnt. Fire will reach from here and go there. And this one, right now it doesn't burn. But this one can be burnt and this one cannot be burnt. So, stop. Now in the next step, this side can be burnt. So the fire from here will reach there. I draw a link where the fire goes. And so there is a burning path for each site. And in the end, all the sites get burnt. And what you get is a spanning tree. So this is the spanning tree I attach to that configuration. Uh, so it has two neighbors, two unburnt neighbors, and its height is three. So we said that the height should be smaller than or equal to bigger than or equal to number of unburnt neighbors. Okay, so it will be burnt, and so on. So the basic rule is that you draw the burning path, burning path is a spanning tree. And different configurations will give rise to different burning paths. So they will give rise to different spanning trees. But there is a little bit of a problem. The problem is that uh, this site I will burn whether the height is 2 or 3. That is the rule. If the height should be greater than or equal to the number of unburnt neighbors. So it's not clear that this mapping is 1 to 1. Different height configurations can lead to the same burning path. Okay, so that is a problem. But I have a um, way out. The point is, if this site is here, it has two input directions in which it can come. So one of them I will attach to two, and one of them I will attach to three. Okay, so we, I will have a rule which is n bigger than e, bigger than s, bigger than w. This is north, east, south, west. And it says that if the height at my site is the highest possible, then burn it from the uh, direction which is uh, amongst the burning path which is available. You know, you cannot burn from everywhere, but from wherever you can burn, find out which one works and burn with using this one. If this one, um, if the height is lower than this, then go to the next. And the number of choices you will have at each stage is always equal to the number of possible heights. So now I have a unique one-to-one -one correspondence between burning paths and spanning trees and the recurrent configuration. Because if the height is 3, I will burn using this one because three, north occurs first. But if the height is 2, I will burn like this. OK? Is this clear? The rule for making this rule, you can choose whatever you like. You can even make it different at different sites. It doesn't matter. The details don't come into play 
but it is nice to make it uniform. But anyway, once you have done it, then the one to one correspondence between spanning trees and burning paths is there. And for each spanning tree, I have a unique assignment of heights. Could you explain again the rule? Now? Okay, the rule is this. I come, okay, let us go through this next one. Here, I come to this side in the next iteration. Now it has only two unburnt neighbors, right? And so it will burn. But will also burn if the height is two or three, right? So which one? But it can also burn from two parts. It can burn like this or it can burn like this. So which arrow will I assign? Well, I will assign the upper arrow because, you know, it, the height is as much as possible. So the first allowed rule is the one I will choose. So I will not pick this path. I will pick this path. Okay? If the height was two here, then I will choose this path. Okay? And you can generalize. So, at each, at each step we choose a not burn site and, and according to the, the same. Uh, no, we choose a site which can be burnt and choose a direction along which it will burn. And that direction has um, one or two or three possible choices. And then I pick the choice, the first one, if the, is the height is maximum possible. And the second one, if it's the next maximum possible, third, if it's the next maximum possible, and so on. If there's only one choice, then I just burn like that. There's nothing to do. Yeah. Why two can be burned now? Uh, sorry, I beg your pardon. This this is and this cannot be no, this is only one choice allowed. Just one second. Uh, yeah, so this just one second. Yeah, so here I will not use this one because this, if it was at this site, I'm burning at the second time step. I'm not burning at the first time step. Okay, so if so, it, this if it was yeah, if it was three, then I could have burnt it in the first time step. Yeah, 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 because now if the height is 2, it has two unburnt neighbors and then it can be burnt. It can be burnt. Height should be bigger than or equal to number of unburnt neighbors. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the number is two. Where yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so if the height is two, yes. and then there are, it can come from here or here. But don't we have a rule that the arrow from O2 must come from east? No, no, no. So it says allowed possible heights could be two or three, then it would be burnt. Yes. So either I can burn from here or from here. So if it comes, if the height is 3, you will burn from the higher preferred one, which is this one. If it is 2, I will burn from here. Uh, okay. So I list the, all, all the possible choice of the arrow, yeah. and I take the first if, uh, if The highest three. possible height, okay. and the next, and next. Okay. 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 Clearly, the rules could have been slightly different, but it does not matter. There is a one-to-one -one correspondence. Yes, sir. Uh, is, this, okay. is it important to put arrows on the direction of the burn? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can do the reverse, but you know, I'm, my fire is going inward and I'm trying to draw the direction of burning, so it goes in. Yes, sir. But, uh, Sorry, ma'am. Uh, number, number of unburnt neighbors. Okay, everything is okay. But it's not uh, here. Just the last question. It's not uh, self-defined because I mean, uh, be, uh, building burning path in this way is hmm? equal to defining a spanning tree. Okay, vice versa. If you take a spanning tree and it burns from here, 
I know what is the height I should have had in order to have selected this edge for burning. Okay, so it is perfect, there is no problem. It is a one to one rule for assigning heights to spanning trees. Okay, the interesting point about this rule is that if you give me a tree, I can even have something like this. Oh, let us draw it. This. I can assign heights to this tree, but it is a very non-local process. The process of assigning heights to a tree depends on whatever happened as very far away in different places. Okay, Because I will have to see how much of things have burnt until now from the left, from the right and so on and so forth. So the rule is very non-local. And so the local properties like heights of the sand pile become non-local properties of the spanning trees and vice versa. Yeah. It does not depend on the ground where you start, does it? It does not depend on the place where you start. It only, but the time ordering has to be there. No, no, no. It is sort of sequential in time. You have to, you can make other rules, but in this rule, there is a at time one you try to burn as many things as possible, then mm, try to burn in the next time step as many things as possible and so on. Okay? Yes. Could it be a situation where the meter we can burn a site Sorry? Can we burn a site in the meter with a burning test that scan everything and we see that oh there's a site in the meter that can be burned? Yeah, but from which direction? That is all I have to decide. It can be burned, but from which direction? You choose the direction based on the height and allowed mm, rules, and then you are done. Okay. So final sight, whatever it is, whether its height is 0 or 1, or everything else is burnt. So I will burn it using whichever direction I have according to my rules. Okay. 0, 1 to 3. Okay, very good. So that gives me a one-to-one -one correspondence between spanning trees and uh, heights. So what is the use of this? Well, the use of this is not so large, as I said, because the correspondence makes some local properties of trees very non-local in sand pile and vice versa. However, some properties can be still determined. In particular, you can ask, suppose there is a big sand pile and I can ask what is the probability that this height is 0. Okay. So what will it show up in the sand pile? In the sand pile it will mean that everything will burn and this thing will burn last. Right. So it says height 0 implies all neighbors burn earlier. Okay. So the number of configurations of the probability of height 0. is equal to number of configurations of this type divided by all possible trees. This is the recurrent set, my determinant delta, set of all recurrent configurations, right? So what is the configurations of this type? that is the ones with height 0, but I can also do it in spanning trees. In spanning trees, the site I add must be a leaf site because it has to burn last. So height 0 means that my site, my selected site is a leaf site.
I guess the notation is clear. Leaf side means in a tree it is the endmost. Now, if you have a tree like this, this side is a leaf side, this side is a leaf side, this side is not a leaf side. Okay? All right. So, how do I count the number of leaf sides? Or what is the, how do I find probability that this is a leaf side? This can be done very easily by saying that, oh, suppose I erase this side, remove this side from the graph, and find the spanning trees on the rest, okay, and then attach one extra bond, and that will, that now the new side will be a leaf side, okay. So, this is equal to number of trees. with site removed divided by number of trees. Okay? Sir, yes? Could you explain why uh, a site with a height zero is a leaf site? Okay. Because by my definition, it can only burn if the number of unburnt neighbor is equal to zero. So, all the other sites must have been burnt before. So, then everything would have some burning path, they would have all have burnt. And now I will add one to this to make this, and then it's over. So, it is the leaf site. Okay? Okay. So, now what is the number of trees with one site removed? Yes, sir. Uh, is it possible to explain it one times more to uh, the, the algorithm? I didn't quite catch that. Okay. The algorithm is that uh, you come to a site and burn it. At the time of burning, more than one bonds for coming to that site are allowed. But the number of choices of coming in is equal to the number of heights I am allowed. Because, you know, I may burn a site when the height is 2 or 3 or something, right? So, it turns out that the number of choices in, of in arrows is equal to the number of choices of heights allowed. And so, I make a one-to-one -one correspondence by this my rule, n bigger than e bigger, whatever, some rule or the other, okay? Okay, so number of trees with one site removed. That is not a very hard problem. What I have to do is I have to take this graph and remove this site. Then I get a spanning tree on the remaining set or I can find all possible spanning trees on the remaining set. And then once I have a tree on the remaining set, I just add a link like this that will make or coming in arrow, sorry. Okay? Okay, so, so this becomes equal to determinant of delta prime divided by determinant of delta. Delta was our original matrix. Delta prime is the new matrix which I obtain by deleting one site, one row and column corresponding to a site. Okay? So, well, this calculation, of course, is non-trivial, but let us see how it is done. So, determinant of delta prime divided by determinant of delta. So, delta prime can be written as delta plus, I chose a notation, this one. So, the small delta is a matrix in which um, most of the entries are 0, but some place there is a min plus 1, plus 1 plus 1, plus 1. So, 4 bonds will be converted from 1, minus 1 to 0 and the central site you can 
it's erased, but you can leave it as one, okay, if you like. And so, this new matrix is obtained from the old one by adding, modifying a finite number of rows and columns, okay. So, that is a small matrix, it's mostly zero, and this is the old matrix. And so, this is equal to determinant of 1 plus delta inverse delta, okay. But now, this delta inverse delta, uh, this is a small matrix, this is a big matrix n by n. But when I multiply this with this, the non-zero entries will be in a finite region and everything else will be fine because it is a small matrix, right, 4 by 4. So, then what happens is that this becomes equal to, so if I write this as a matrix, it will be 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, and there is a small block which is non-trivial. Small delta is the correction to delta which I have to add to make the matrix delta prime. Right? Yeah, yeah, the ah. matrix is the same dimension, but it has a lot of zero entries. Yeah, okay. okay, so when I write this, of course they have the same dimension, that is how you multiply them. But now when I write delta inverse delta, this matrix also will have very many zeros and small number of entries. Okay, so then this matrix is still n by n, but most of the entries are 1 and then there is a small block which is non 1. So, then the determinant of this is equal to the determinant of the small matrix, because the other parts is just 1. So, now the calculation reduces to calculating the determinant of a 5 by 5 matrix, the central site and its four neighbors. Those are the only ones where the entries are changed. And the entries are um, delta inverse ij delta jk is the matrix element of the this block, right. So, you need to know matrix elements of delta inverse, but they are easy to compute. Um, or you can do it, or we have already done it in some way. Delta inverse was a matrix we calculated because we wrote down all the in, in eigenvectors and eigenvalues of delta. <coughs> so, then in the end this gives me, this, this calculation, the matrix elements of delta inverse are non-trivial in general, but they have been worked out, it is called the lattice greens function. And I put in that stuff and I put in the 4 by 4 matrix and I do all the calculation, just one second. Then I get the probability of height 0 is equal to determinant of a 5 by 5 matrix, which I can work out and it gives me 2 by pi squared into 1 minus 2 by pi. Yes. No, but you can write it on the left or on the right and in each case you will get the same answer. Yes. I, I did not understand the very first passage when uh, we rewrite, re 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 wrote the uh, uh, determinant of delta prime. Hmm. Delta prime is… Uh, n by n matrix. N by n. Uh, you can put a 1 in the um, n, nth entry uh, in the diagonal and keep it n by n. And you yeah, put but, a one in the diagonal. Yeah. So, how can you rewrite it as uh, delta plus uh, a correction? Because you just uh, define delta as, as, as the difference of the two, of course. Okay. Okay. Okay, and it will be zero in most of the places, and it will not zero only in a few elements. And so, this can be calculated, and it turns out to be this very nice-looking number. But the probability does not depend on the position of the. Yeah, so this is away from the boundary. This okay. is deep inside, where all the values of the determinant this delta inverse matrix elements are taken to be in bulk away from the boundary. And we, we consider the dimension uh, 
very large, eh? somehow. The L is okay. large, yeah. Otherwise, these numbers depend on the size. Okay. Okay, yeah, so in the large L limit. In the large L limit away from the boundary. Of course, it depends on the form. Oh, small delta is a fixed matrix. No, there is no choice about there. It's a, it entries are one and zero. And so you, you did a, a particular choice for delta. Of course, ah, the, okay. for small delta, there is no choice because it is the difference between the matrix with uh, that those edges, four edges coming to the site removed. Okay. Right. So I have no choice about small delta. It's a fixed matrix. And uh, I just calculate, and that's what it gives. Sorry, but the small delta is a matrix of 1 and 0, right? Uh, except in the diagonal. The diagonal, you have to put 3, minus 3. OK, well, how it can be 2 over pi square? Huh, because the um, delta pi. inverse ah, okay. ij, they involve 1 by pi. Actually, it's a very nice non-trivial result which you should look up to check what is delta inverse. Of uh, R R prime, R plus Mn. Okay, the exercise I give you as homework exercise is like delta inverse of 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1. It's like calculating the matrix element of delta inverse amongst nearest neighbors. But you can do the same problem with next neighbors, third neighbors, fourth neighbors. And that is what matrix elements of delta inverse are. And it turns out they are always of the form A plus 1 by pi B, where A and B are simple fractions, rational numbers. And if when you go out, the numbers become bigger. And the same thing happens on the triangular lattice. Uh, you always get something plus 1 by pi times something else. So why is there a pi there? I don't know. It just happens. Okay. Sorry? Just one zero. It's the probability of having just one zero. Yeah, just one zero. Anyway, you cannot have two adjacent zeros. You cannot have. Those are forbidden configurations. Even if they are far. Ah, if they are far. Okay. So, Daniel asks, what happens if you have two zeros which are at a distance? So, I have a zero here and I have a zero here. What is the probability of ZR1 equal to ZR2 equal to zero? So, the method is working. All I got to say is that at both these sides, both the uh, nodes should be leaf sides. Okay? And then I can again construct a matrix delta, which will be the difference matrix, and uh, calculate. But now the matrix will be 10 by 10 instead of 5 by 5. And I can work it out. And so the answer turns out to be. More or less, if r are far away, it's the square of this number. But uh, so it is probability a of z1, zr1 equal to 0, zr2 equal to 0 is equal to probability of zr1 equal to 0, probability of z r2 equal. These are, of course, equal. But there is a correction term, which can be worked out from the properties of these determinants. Now, it is a 10 by 10 determinant, so I got to be working harder. You don't have to work out the full determinant. It goes as 1 upon r to the power 2d times a number. So, the matrix elements go like 1 by r, and there are many of them, and you have got to put large powers of them, and then you can check that in 2D, it goes as 1 upon r to the power 4, 
in higher dimensions it will go as r to the power 2 d. Okay. This calculation I will not do on the board here. You are um, referred to the paper which has a lot of calculation. Okay. Okay. So, very good. So, now what we want to do is we want to study a different problem. Just for me. Okay. And so, the directed sand piles is a particular version of these kinds of sand pile models and they are particularly simple, simple and simpler than the one we just discussed and so, in there the answers can be obtained in somewhat more detail, more easily uh, with less work and so, that is what we will like to discuss now. Okay, there, there was some question before. Yes. Okay, firstly, I can just calculate them and they turn out to be positive. They were defined, they were well defined problems. I started with a well defined problem. I have not made any mistake so far in the formulation. So, the answer should be positive. See, you are asking why should I have known beforehand that the answer is positive? Because I made a well defined problem whose answer I know is positive and I have not made a mistake so far, then the determinant is positive. What is the problem? No, um, I thought that maybe uh, we should take absolute value. No, 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 no absolute value. The argument was good without the absolute value, right? It was a probability of something, it was a number divided by another number. So, if I have calculated them correct, they should be positive. Yes, uh, no, um, uh, I mean the, uh, for example, the item 3 here. Uh, this one, 3, yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. It's the number of spanning trees, no, so it's positive. It is not true for all matrices delta, all the matrices delta which correspond to the adjacency matrix of a graph will have a spanning tree interpretation, will have positive numbers. You mean it should be positive by answer? By, by definition, the delta is not any possible delta, it is the delta which is the adjacency matrix of a graph, then the result is positive. Okay? Okay. So, directed sand piles. So, the origin of these sand piles uh, for us was because I listened to a talk by Pierre Bach where he described the sand pile model and uh, he said that this also explains how the river Nile has undergoes these very huge fluctuations and so on and so forth and uh, we did not believe him. So, we thought we will try to disprove whatever he says. So, we tried to construct a model where this argument does not work. And uh, so, it turned out that that model was much simpler than this mo starting sand pile model and uh, we could actually solve it exactly without too much work, it will be done within the remaining one hour. Okay? So, that is what I want to describe to you. But let us pose the problem originally. So, the problem is posed as there is a child with lot of wooden blocks and he is sitting on the top of a staircase and he throws the blocks on the staircase and uh, so the staircase kind of looks like this.
you see sort of the picture and the blocks look like this. There is a block here and there is a block here. And uh, then uh, now he throws another block. So now the block may sit on top of each other. But we said that two blocks on top of each other are unstable. So they will not be able to stay there, they will topple. They will topple down to the floor, to the um, rung below, and they will go to adjacent sides below. And so they will then sit here. And then, you know, then if he throws more, then even these will go down. And there is the mother at the bottom of the staircase who is playing with the child. So she keeps on removing all the um, blocks which come to the bottom rung and gives them back to the um, top. Okay. So this is the model. This is a, actually a better model of sand piles because it's well known that in real sand piles, there is a layer which is kind of rigid and there is just a top surface which fluctuates a little bit. And the rigid layer below we are replacing by a staircase and the top layer which fluctuates we are replacing by these wooden blocks which have height 1 or 0. So it has a like random fluctuating height and it has a spatial extent in this direction. So the formal model is defined like this, there is a lattice. which is the square lattice but tilted. Okay. And so we say Z i is equal to 0 or 1 are stable. If Z i is bigger than 2, bigger than 1, then two blocks leave two sides to drop down to sides below. So from here, one will go here and one will go here. From here, one will go here and one will go here, like that. Okay. So we will take periodic boundary conditions in the horizontal direction, this will be called M, this will be called L and there is a bottom. So M is the number of distinct sides on one layer and there are L such layers, this is the first layer, this is the second layer, this is the third layer, this is the fourth layer. Each layer has exactly M sides. Okay, is the model clear? Yes. Except at the boundary. When they are at the boundary, the mm, blocks leave. No, the, the, she puts them in a basket in the top so that the child can throw it whenever it wants. Okay. Any other questions? So actually, if you go back and check all the arguments about a billion property, whatever are working, and so the determinant is equal to the determinant of delta for this problem. Okay, but now I have a nice matrix delta. The matrix delta is of the type like this. I will write it in a very schematic way. It's two, 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 two. 0 and minus 1, minus 1. It is an upper triangular matrix because everything is connected to things below and things below do not have any arrows coming up. So if you have a neighbor, it is that way and that one has a neighbor that way and so the matrix delta is upper triangular. Is this point clear? Upper triangular means a matrix whose all the entries below the diagonal are 0. What, why is that? Because there are no neighbors which uh, known a site below 
is not connected to a site above. Okay, so, it is a directed send file, it is the matrix is unsymmetrical now. Okay, but now it is very easy because the determinant of this matrix is easy to determine, it is just the product of diagonals. Yeah, so it is 2 to the power L m determinant of delta is equal to 2 to the power L m that did not require any work. But 2 to the power L m is also the total number of stable configurations. So, all stable configurations occur with equal probability in the steady state. Okay. Very good. So, all stable configurations occur actually all 2 to the power n, 2 to the power L m stable configurations occur with equal probability in the steady state. So, this problem now becomes much simpler than the previous one because the steady state measure is much more easier to handle. So, for example, I can ask So, I take this pile, I keep it running and then I add one grain probability oh I pick this site some site in between, what is the probability that the height there is 0? It is half because all configurations occur with equal probability and all the measure is a product measure. Is that point clear? You are not convinced. It is okay. okay. So, probability of any site, this site is 0, this site is 0, what is the joint probability that two sites are height 0? 1 by 4, what is the probability that this site is height 0, this site is height 1, so also 1 by 4. So, it is it's very easy to calculate all these marginal joint probability distributions, which we could not do in the other sand pile problem so easily. You know I said there is a, this 10 by 10 determinant, do not ask me how to do it here on the board. Here you ask me, I will do it on the board. Okay? All right. So then I can ask the questions about avalanches. I add a grain. What is the probability that it will just go there and not cause any avalanche? The, whatever is the result of the relaxation process for this particle to relax until it gets to a stable state. There, is, there are a number of toplings and the number of toplings will be called s and the duration of toplings is the time it takes to get there. Uh, okay. So, when the number of toplings is 0, then we say there is no avalanche. So, what is the probability that when you add a grain, just become stable and there is no toppling? Half because it the original height must be 0 and that occurs with probability half. So, probability s equal to 0 is equal to half. Okay. I can ask what is the probability that s equal to 1? Well, there should be a toppling, but there should be only one toppling. So, I take this site. Here, the height should be 1 because it topples but then it will send two particles down on addition and both of these should be height 0, otherwise they will cause further toppling. So, this should be 1 and this should be not top, this should topple and this should not topple and so this occurs with probability half times half times half which is 1 by 8. Okay that was not a lot of work. What is the probability that s equal to 2? Okay, now, there are different possible avalanches I can make. One is 
that this side topples, it throws out two particles and this side topples, but then this throws out something, but this does not topple and this does not topple and this does not topple. That is one possible avalanche of size 2. There is another possible avalanche which is this one, that this side topples, this side topples, but this side does not topple and this does not topple and this does not topple. That is all that can happen, nothing else. What is the probability that this configuration will be reached in the, in the random in starting point? Well, this should occur with probability half, this should be 1, this should be 1, this should be 0, 0, 0. 1 upon 2 to the power 5. And so, this answer is, there are two such configurations. Okay. And then I can go to probability of s equal to 3. The key point is that in each case, there is a finite number of graphs to be counted and you just count them all and then you are done. So, what are the possibilities for s equal to 3? Well, you could have something like this, this goes here, this goes here, this goes here and then it stops. So, this should not cause anything, this should not cause anything, this should not cause anything, this should not cause anything. Or you can have a graph which looks like this. Or you can have a graph which looks like this or you can have a graph which looks like that. Anything else? No, well, because in principle there could be something like this. This causes two toppling, but these do not topple. Sorry, no further topplings. Okay? That is not possible because if these two topple, then this height, whether its height was 0 or 1, will also topple. So, this will not be allowed. So, this is not there. These are only four possible graphs. So, it is 4 into 1 upon 2 to the power 7 and so on. So, I am actually able to calculate the probability of exactly s topplings for any finite s by a straightforward finite procedure. Like I been, I did not do it, but I can do it up to 5 by just sitting down on a piece of paper and you can write a computer program which will count all the graphs and do some such thing for a slightly bigger value of s. And so, then uh, this particular question, what is the distribution of sizes of events? And we have been able to address directly simply in this problem. Okay? Yes. Precisely. Okay. So, now, but you know, okay, this is a finite s, but I would like to know what is the behavior of this function for large s. Okay. So, then, uh, so let us look at that problem now. So, I start with this site. Oh, sorry. I start with this site here and I, they topple and let us say these two things topple and then it goes down and this does not topple. But we said, we already noticed that if a site has two upward neighbors which topple, then it also has to topple, whatever happens. Okay? So, the allowed avalanche clusters will be of this type. They will have a boundary, there will be a set of topple sites. Each topple site will topple once exactly and this cluster will have no holes. Okay. So, the cluster is fully specified by its two boundaries, left boundary and right boundary. And uh, what does the left boundary do when the particle is here? It comes, you know, it throws a particle here, but it may be 0 or 1. If it is 0, then this is not part of the cluster. If it is 1, it is part of the cluster. So, each boundary does an unbiased random walk with probability half it goes left, with, with probability half it goes right as it goes down. Okay? And when the two left and right boundaries meet, then the cluster is finished and stopped. 
So the problem becomes the problem of two random walkers on a line with unbiased random walkers and when they meet then the cluster stops. Okay? So that problem has been studied a lot already, you know, I, we didn't have to solve it because it was give, the answer was given in Feller. And so you can ask, so this is done with probability that t equal to 0, which is the duration of the avalanche. Okay? So that is still half. Uh, S equal to 1 is the same thing. 1 by 8 and I can do this. But now in my new problem, it is that there is a left boundary and there is a right boundary and they, when we, what is the first time the two walkers will come together at the same site? That is the question. T is the duration of the avalanche, which is how many time steps are required for the avalanche to be over. And if S is 0, then T is also 0. When S is 1, T is also 1. When S is 2, T is also 2. But they are not equal, same statistics. They are different things. So later on, S will be much bigger than T, maybe. Right? So now I am asking, what is the distribution of um, sizes T? And the answer is, probability of t is equal to probability of reunion of unbiased random workers on a line so this one is known the answer is already known so the probability is 1 upon 2t plus 1 I noted this down just so that I don't make any mistakes in algebra. 2t two plus 2 choose t plus 1 4 to the power minus t minus minus 2 uh, minus t minus 2. Okay? <laughs> Refer to Feller for proof. Is the problem statement clear? We said that the avalanche will form clusters. The clusters will have no holes. And the boundaries of clusters do random walks. And then you ask what is the probability that two random walkers starting from 1-1 one, one, will meet at some point. Yes. Can, can you write the last part bigger? Yes, last part bigger. Just one second. Let me first write the last part bigger. So this is equal to 1 upon 2t plus 1, uh, 2t plus 2t plus 1. This is a combinatorial factor, Bernoulli coefficient, and 4 to the power minus t minus 1. Check. When I put t equal to 0, I get 2 c 1 upon 2, 1, 4 to the power minus 1, 1 upon 2 by 2. It's working at least at t equal to 0, the equation works. So you can check that it works for other values of t also exactly. Uh, sorry, just to, what's the difference between s and t? Uh, okay, so s is the number of toplings in the avalanche, t is the duration of the avalanche. Duration means how many time steps before it gets over. On each time step, I do several toplings on the same layer. All the sides on the same layer are toppled together. Okay? Yes? It is not clear to me why there shouldn't be holes inside the cluster. Okay, very good. So the point is this. So there is a cluster. Now this, this, if there is a hole, there is a topmost side of the hole. And you look at this. Yeah. So, so, but now, all the two sides above it must topple, and so it must also topple. So, end of proof. Okay. Okay. So it's very simple and straightforward, and so it says, probability of duration of avalanche 
greater than t goes like 1 upon t to the power half. This is from random walk results. Or from that equation, you put Stirling's formula, you get this. OK? So now, if you take a big avalanche like this, its duration is t, then the width of the cluster will be t to the power half. And so s goes like t to the power 3 by 2. This one? No, okay. So if you take a cluster, we have already said that it's formed by two random walks which meet at time t. So on the average, the width of the cluster, which is defined as the mean width, will go as t to the power half. And the total number of toplings will go as the width into height. So it will go as t to the power 3 by 2. Okay? So the s goes like t to the power 3 by 2. And the probability that number of toplings is greater than s goes as 1 upon s to the power 1 third. And so this relation is, you know, this equation is also exact. So we have exactly determined the distribution of event sizes for this directed senpai <laughs> model. Okay. Okay, so now in the remaining time, what should I do? Yes, please. Yes. Is there any connection to direction small population model? I don't know about that. Mm, it's, no, I refuse. I am size stepping the question. We don't want to discuss it now. Okay? No, this is a. Um, it is called a special case of compact directed percolation. Compact is precisely the fact that the, there are no holes. So if you make a directed percolation in which there are no holes, then this is the same model. Okay. So now, what we would like to do is to describe other models which are equivalent to this model. DASM is directed abelian sand pile model. Directed means just the fact that the delta matrix is upper triangular and the bones are directed. Okay? So, firstly, uh, you can do this in higher dimensions. There is no problem. Everything goes through. The extension of the results to higher dimension is auto straightforward, not trivial, but straightforward. Okay? So I will not do it here. Okay? So there is a model which is uh, in literature called Scheidegger River Networks. It's a very nice and interesting model, and it was proposed by a hydrologist to describe the shapes of river networks. So let us just backtrack a little bit. So the general idea of river networks is that there is some landscape and some rain falls per year, and whatever water comes, some of it is evaporated, some of it goes under the ground but the rest of it goes off into the sea. How does it go into the sea? It just flows downhill and it forms tiny streams which sometimes merge to form bigger streams and those streams merge to form bigger streams until you have big rivers and finally the river goes into a sea. 
So these networks in general are called drainage networks. So you imagine that this region has some water which is coming down and all this water has to drain into the sea and what path will the water take to drain? And the answer is that the path the water takes is a tree graph, usually. Once in a while people know of rivers which go like this. Okay, like in Paris, I think there is a river, in the middle of the river there is an island and so on. But these are actually not so common. Actually, they are quite common. In Bangladesh, the river looks like this. It has a lot of um, parts which cut and recombine. And so in delta regions, generally, you have a different structure where the different streams can rejoin. But in most of the other parts, the streams don't rejoin. If in, sorry, the yeah, the streams join together, but they don't break up. One river doesn't become two rivers. Two rivers become one river most of the time. Okay? So this model only describes the first process in which small rivers join up to form big rivers, which is roughly true in mountainous areas. And um, so we will not discuss. I'm only pointing out that this model is not perfect, but it is a approximate but interesting good model. So what Scheidegger said was that you imagine that let us say there is a landscape like this. There is a uniform slope down. So we are not worried about the fact that some regions can have higher slope and other places have lower slope. So, and all the water which goes, which comes to a point has to go down. But there is also a rain at each area. So the, some more water joins to it and then it goes down. This excess rain per area is soon to be uniform. There is a uniform rainfall all over the land area. Okay? And now we can represent the land by some grid. So I take this grid. Like that. You can take as big a grid as you like. And then the on the top there is one unit of water which comes per year. Okay? And this water flows down. So where does it go? This water can flow down with equal probability this way or that way. You know the river channel forms somehow and then in the water just flows along the river channel. So the model assumes that at each node there is a particular direction chosen at random by history where the water goes. Okay? So at each node you assign a random downward direction. Here it goes this way, here it goes that way, here it goes that way, here it goes that way and so on. Here it goes this way. Okay? You assign a downward direction randomly to each <coughs> node. And then you look at the structure of the full graph. So here is the C. So you know whatever goes down is good. What goes down from here it can go here. So, the claim is that what you get is a spanning tree graph. Okay? It's a spanning tree graph because from each node there is a unique path to the sea. Okay? And uh, then, you know, right now this, so this describes a river network. These rivers, you go now oh, from here. It has to go somewhere. Let's say it goes here, like that. And that was proposed as a fair model 
of the river networks in mount sort of areas with reasonable slope. Okay. So now what can I say about this network? Oh, well, I can say what is the flow out of a node? So this node has flow 1, this node has flow 1, this has two things coming in. But the things going out of, so here the flow is 1 unit, here the flow is 3 units, here the flow is 1 unit, here this is 1, here there is 3, here this is 1. And this one will be 3 plus 1, 4 plus 1, 5 and so on. You can calculate the total flow down the river at any node. Okay? And then at any node, there is a region which is called the catchment basin of the node. All the water which falls in this region goes down this river, goes down at this point, through this point. Okay, so now uh, can we describe something about the statistics of this network? Um, so there are some very standard laws of hydrology, which are defined like Strahler rank of a river. So the Strahler rank of a river is defined like this. If you have a network like this of rivers, okay, all the rivers which come, which are the leaf nodes of the network. Now the I'm using the word leaf for branches. All the branches which uh, end someplace, they will be called rivers of rank one. This is a river of rank one. Two rivers of rank one, when they join, they form a river of rank two. Okay, when a river of rank two joins a river of rank one, it is called a river of rank two. It doesn't change its name. But when two rivers of rank two join, they form a river of rank three. And so on. So you can start with very tiny rivulets, and then they form a river of rank one, rank two, rank three, and so on. It goes on. And then, uh, given a big network, you can ask how many rivers are there of rank 1, how many rivers of rank 2, how many rivers of rank 3, and so on. Okay? And there is a very interesting law, which is called Horton's law, which says number of rivers of rank R divided by number of rivers of rank R plus 1, it is a number like 4.3 and it is independent of R, whichever network you pick. And it has been tested a lot in, in real observations, in real maps people make. And uh, you know, it is interesting if you can understand where this law comes from, okay. So, so now, so now, suppose I look at the catchment basin of the river living at a particular point, okay catchment basin of the river living at a particular point. The claim is the statistics of this catchment basin is exactly the same as the catchment of avalanche being of that shape. Okay? The proof we will give will be by construction. So it says what is the probability that I pick this site and nothing is coming into it. Nothing is coming into it is the probability that this side has an arrow which is going that way and this side which is arrow which is going that way, right? So what is the probability? 1 by 4. The probability that a site will have no river coming into it is 1 by 4. So what will be the flow out of that point? 
will be 1. Okay? So, what is the probability that if I pick a node at random, it will have an outflow 1? I pick a node at random, you know, so in the network, then sometimes a lot of reward water is flowing down, sometimes less. So, what is the probability that water flowing down is 1? Nothing is coming in, only one unit is going out, which is local. So, probability is 1 by 4, we just calculate it. Okay. So, very good. So, what is the probability that flow out is equal to? So, other possibility is that there is something which is coming in, but nothing else is coming in. So, what will be the flow out of this river? 1, then 1, 2. What is the probability that I pick a site at random that it will have two things, river going out will have flow you two units. It must have a catchment basin which is two units because all that water has to flow down. What is the probability that catchment basin is two units? It can be like this or it can be like this. What is the probability of this? Well, this should have nothing coming in, this should have nothing coming in, this should have nothing coming in. So, the arrow here should be this way, the arrow here should be this way, uh, this arrow should be this way, this arrow should be this way and that is all and um, sorry, yeah and that is all, right. So, I can calculate these explicitly and you will see that you encounter exactly the same types of, you know, you, if I want to find probability that the cluster is of size 3, then I had this graph and that graph and that graph, you count them, they are exactly the same. So, the statistics of clusters in the Scheidegger river basins, catchment basins in Scheidegger network is exactly the same as the statistics of the avalanches in the 2D directed abelian sand pile model. So, then we can solve, we have solved the problem in some way. What is the probability that the catch flow out will be bigger than s? Is s to the power minus 1 by 3 because it is the same as the probability that the number of topplings caused by an avalanche is bigger than s. Okay. So, it is a non trivial result about a model which was already known, but now you can solve it exactly. You know, this model is I think 1950 or so, Scheidegger model but they were hydrologists, they were only doing field data, they were not making lattice model. They, the model is a lattice model, it was made by him, but they did not analyze it in this way. But now you can kind of show that, of, you know, it has this distribution of sizes. Okay. Okay, I still have time, so very good, I can do something more. So, this Strahler ranking of rivers is also valid for other networks which are not directed. And uh, one can study them in more detail, which I will not do just now. But let us do this Takayasu. Oh, I made a mistake. Aggregation model. This was already defined. Yes, please. Sorry? Just to be sure. The run is just the same as the flow out. No, no, no. No. If you have a river like this, okay, the rank here is always 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, and here the rank becomes 2, 2, 2. Okay. Okay. So it is a different statistics. Okay. The flow out will change, but the rank will not change. No, no, no. So, here in the Scheidegger network, there are always some nodes here which do not get anything from above. So, that is also a leaf node. It has no input, it only throws out something. The number of such nodes is density 1 by 4. With probability 1 by 4, each site will have no upward neighbors, which come with no water coming into it. Right? So, lot of sites 
we'll have just one tiny stream of rank and one flow unit coming out. So, so how do you define the rank? Sorry. The rank will be one by definition to these nodes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the, then you have to look at the statistics of how they are merging. So there may be a river which is rank one because you know nothing is joining it. If something joins it, then this becomes rank two. Okay. So you have to look at the topography of the full graph. Then you can assign ranks. Rank is a non-local statistics. It cannot be decided on the basis of local measurement. Yeah. So the rank is a, a weight uh, assigned to each. Uh, it is a rank. No, you know, like a lot of students appear for exams, some people get, uh, rank is like division. It is a class. It is a broad, you know, uh, first class, second class, third class, like that. Rank is number of leads. No, no, no. No. Uh, so, let me draw a network. Uh, okay, so this is rank 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, this is 2. All this river, all the way will be rank 2, this is 1, 1, 1. Now this join, this is still rank 2. This is 1, 1, 1, this is still rank 2. This is 1, 1, 1, this is 2, 2, 2, this is 1, 1, this is 2, this is 1, this is 2, but this is 3. And this goes to be 3, and this is 3, like that. So it is not, not related to the nodes at all. The rank defines the number of, uh, I will give you some logic behind this. So at least in India, there is a river, you know, very famous river, Ganga, no? But in the beginning, it has small streams. So there is a stream called Alaknanda, there is a stream called Bhagirathi. They are two names. But when they join up, that river is called Ganga. The river has a different name after the two small streams join. None of the two strong, small streams qualifies for that name. Okay? So, there is a point in this. If a big river is joined by a narrow stream, Nala, just a drainage from one tiny house, we don't change the name of the river. It has the same name. But if two big rivers join, then you perhaps want to change the name of the river. No, 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 it makes sense. So the rank is like the name of a river which is conserved under tiny perturbations but not perturbed under equal perturbations because now two rivers are joining of the same rank. Then which one will keep its name, which one will not keep its name? So then we just give it a new name to the new river. So that is the logic behind the rank. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, catchment basin. Suppose there is a river network, and then you look at a site. All the water which comes flows out of this site has come in as rain from some place. So all the area, the water of which is flowing down this point, is called the catchment basin of the river at that point. Okay. okay, so now we want to go to this Takayashu model and uh, there was a question. Okay, so Takayashu model we defined already. There is a lattice. Every site you add one um, particle at each time and then the particles jump to neighbors at random and they merge. Okay. So now, initially, there were particles here. You know, so say I start with empty thing. Then you add one particle at each side. And this particle jumps here. This particle jumps there. This particle jumps here. This particle jumps there. This particle jumps here, jumps there. Now there are two particles here. But you add one, so it becomes three. And then this jump, it goes here. And this one goes here. This one goes here. This one didn't get anything, so it has only one particle coming in. And then this one jumps here and so on. Right? So this was the Takayashu aggregation model, which was describing 
the dynamics of um, aggregating masses on a one dimensional line. But the way I described it, I guess, is the same as the river network model. You just have to identify the time direction as the flow of the river downward. If you go from the top level to the next level to the next level, it's exactly the same dynamics. Okay. So now I can again ask that if I have this Takayashu aggregation model, the masses mean mass keeps on increasing with time. But if I look at a particular time, what is the probability that a particular site will have mass only one at the end of this process? Sorry, let's say, so the process is like this. There is a time unit, then you add, and then you jump, and then you coalesce. Okay, and I want to measure what happens now. So I have a long line. I can ask how many of the sites on this line will have weight zero? No particle there. The answer is 1 by 4 because, you know, if you are at this site, something must be jumping from the left, something must be jumping from the right. But if nothing jumps in, then the height will be 0 now. So what is the probability that whatever was here jumped, chose to jump this way and not this way and this one jumped that way and not this way is 1 by 4. Okay. So the mean mass may be very big. but uh, fraction one-fourth of them have mass zero. Then what is the fraction of sites which have mass exactly one? The same calculation which we did before, which we will not repeat, gives you that a finite fraction of sites have mass only one, and a finite fraction have mass two, and so on. Okay? So this Takayashu aggregation model is the same as the um, directed sand pile model. As a model of SOC, what it says is that the probability distribution of mass m at a site as a function of m has this tail, which now we are saying is m to the power minus 4 by 3, because the probability, cumulative probability goes down as one third power and the mass distribution goes as minus 4 by 3. The mean mass will be infinite. This is a, so if you work at finite time, the distribution goes like this the maximum mass increases with time and the moment increases linearly with time and in the steady state which is not fully defined but this distribution tends to a finite limit and if you define that as the steady state then that is uh, the distribution. What are the big events there? I sit at a place and I ask what you know if some big mass comes there that is a big event and then if the next time step it will leave and it may come back after two years. So that is the diff time interval between big events and you can ask what is the probability of you know that at any time there is a big mass happening someplace or something like that. And um, so that model is uh, an interesting model and uh, tells us something about SOC and it is the same as a simple model we have already solved. And the same thing happens for Takayashu model in 2D or the Scheidegger model in 2 plus 1D. What is a 2 plus 1D river network model? So you have a volume in which sir, rivers have to flow. So it is actually well known. It is called the blood circulation network. The point is you have tissues in a human body. They are made of cells. Each cell needs nutrient. The nutrient is provided by blood. Blood comes and gives the nutrient. So there is a cell network of capillaries which provides each cell with some blood. Okay? And so if we think of it as a, um, so here is my set of mass. This is some muscle. And here is my nutrient. And this has to go and reach all the cells here. It forms this network 
of capillaries. which will reach all the points in the cell. So, this network is a tree, it is a spanning tree. Now, it is in 3D, it is a 3D spanning tree. Okay? So, the statistics of such networks will be interesting in um, understanding um, capillary network of um, the veins and arteries in, of the blood in animals. Okay. Let me just point out that when in this model we distinguish between supply networks and drainage networks. Supply networks are the ones which supply something and once it is supplied then you do not worry about it. You know it is like um, it is like postal service you know there is a lot of postage and that postman has to come and deliver to each house something. But there is also a second thing which is called drainage network which you already introduced which cons consists of not supplies but refuse. You have a lot of waste product and you have to collect them and garbage, garbage collection networks. All the garbage has to be collected in trucks which have to go to another place and so on and so forth. So, we are th distinguishing between the supply networks and the uh, collection networks. But maybe the, you know, so there are veins and there are arteries, and I want to distinguish between the two. Okay. So if you look at just the veins, then they form a network like this. If you look at just the arteries, they will also form a network like this. But if you put them together, then you are getting confused. It may be that a biologist cannot always tell if a particular blood capillary is um, inflow or outflow. In this simple model, we distinguish. Then you can worry about how to get, you know, how to take care of this confusion. That we will not do. Okay, so very good. Now I have only seven minutes left. Yes, please. Not exactly. They are all, yeah, the, the main difference is that this one is a constraint of spanning tree, means every side should be covered by the mm, network. While in electrical discharge, there is no such requirement. You know, mm, the electric spark occurs from there to there, all the other places, there, there is no spark, it does not bother them. In our problem, we have insisted because of various physical constraints that every side should have an um, part of the tree coming, spanning tree, it has to be a spanning tree. If you do not have a spanning tree, then you do not have this structure necessarily. Okay. Uh, I think people have argued for uh, river networks are like electric breakdown, you know, so, so they say some water is, go, is going down, it can go further left or right and just moves like that. Uh, yeah, I am not particularly fond of those models. They have not worked very well in the past. It is one thing to propose a model because I like the model. The other thing is to make sure that it is actually realistic. So, the electric breakdown models are I do not think are honestly good models of river networks. A spanning tree model is philosophically is definitely better. Because we say that you know every site should have some rain and it should have a drainage out. So what people say is that, um, yeah, what people say is if I take a map of some country and I look at the river network of the in the map, I don't see a spanning tree. The rivers don't span all the uh, map. No, it will be too cluttered. So in real maps, what people do? is they only draw rivers of a rank bigger than something. They do not draw tiny and tiny rivulets, tiny drainage from city. Each city will have 15 houses, each one has a one drainage out. We do not draw all that. So, in a typical map, you will only draw map rivers of a rank bigger than 5. 
then if you want more, then you will draw a rank bigger than 4. But if you, so if you take a river network and delete some of the rivers, it's too small, I am not going to worry about them. If the flow is less than so many cusacs of water, then I am not going to draw them. Then you don't get a spanning tree. But then it is part of the original spanning tree which you have deleted some edges and kept some others and so on. So you can keep, you can have that in mind and you can study the statistics of these graphs as well, which is a little bit more complicated. But it is the same, it is saying that uh, what, how many sites have flow out which is bigger than 100 units, right? So that is the question we kind of addressed already. Yes. Yes and no. Yeah, so on the whole, if you have a network like this, uh, so you can look at the actual implementation, you can look at river you know, geographical maps and you can check that they don't seem to fill all space. The reason is twofold. Sometimes the data is sparse. In very mountainous regions, there are very tiny rivulets and I don't have data. You know, river is not always flowing and all that kind of problems. So, sparseness of data is one reason. Uh, but as we said, if the rivers are small, you don't draw them. Then it turns out that the, you can easily check in this case that it is not the same thing. Just coarse graining will not make a spanning tree a non-spanning tree. You have to put this extra constraint about flow bigger than something, rank bigger than something. Then you get a non-spanning tree graph. Okay. So, last item. Uh, so, group, uh, fragmentation, patterns formed by branching merging, propagating, fragment by propagating, branching and merging cracks. Okay. So, we imagine that there is some two-dimensional sheet, okay, and uh, under stress of various sorts, it develops cracks, and these cracks then propagate, and uh, then when they propagate, they can branch into two, and then the branches can propagate but if they, mm, there may be another crack and they merge. If two branches come together, then they merge, okay? And uh, then it keeps on going mm, and then you get some pattern of fragments in of the original stuff. So, you can look at crockery and you can see crack patterns on crockery and you can ask what is the statistics of these fragments in this, right? That is a reasonably interesting question. Uh, there are other fragmentation patterns which are like you look at land and then uh, when the water dries then the mud cracks and you get sort of crack patterns in mud like that. I guess all of you are familiar. I am not showing pictures. Um, is that uh, familiar? Okay. So, very good, we want to understand the statistics of these cracks. So, it turns out that there is a one particular um, system which is of some interest. 
which is uh, glaciers which merge into the sea. So in the north, near the pools, there are a lot of glaciers and they have ice and then there is a sea here. And what happens is that this ice keeps on developing cracks and the cracks go into the sea, North Sea. And then they go away and they melt somewhere and then the water goes to Saudi Arabia or where, you know, it joins with the normal sea. And there is a question that maybe the, the ice in the polar region is melting too much and if it melts very fast then all the sea levels will rise and a lot of cities near the sea will be submerged and so on and so forth. So there is an importance to understand uh, the sea level rise expected in the next few years in climate change models. And there it is important to figure out how much does the ice melt uh, goes into the sea. And so there is a model of the melting of the glaciers to go into the sea. And these things are called uh, Calvin termini. So calving is calf, which is this baby cow. There is a mother cow and the baby is called the baby cow. And the small part which breaks off is called the calf. And this process of breaking is called um, calving. And it occurs at the terminals of glaciers. <coughs> so that is what we are trying to make a model of. Okay. So the model which was already proposed by other people is the following, that uh, here is my glacier and here is my sea. So a crack forms somewhere near the bound, somewhere, you know, let us not worry where it forms, uh, crack forms. Then it propagates, roughly it propagates along the front, you know, because this is hot and this is cold and it propagates along the bound, in the direction per parallel to the sea direction, okay. But it diffuses a little bit, it can shift a little bit to the left, it, it does a random walk of sorts. But it can also develop a branching with some finite probability, a crack will become two cracks and they propagate and then this can become three cracks and so on. And then if two cracks come together, they can merge. Okay, so this is all that we will like to model. So I take a finite system. My time is up. Uh, let me take three minutes. So here is my system, here is my time, there is a crack which propagates, it breaks and then uh, rejoins and then breaks and rejoins and breaks and rejoins like that. And so once the crack has gone further, you are left behind with a fragmentation pattern. The glacier left behind is fragmented fully into small bits. And the sizes of these bits is what is important because, you know, each fragment falls to, into the sea together. And the rate at which, uh, you know, these fragments form or something is what we are trying to study. Okay. So the model is like this, that there is a rate at which it breaks and then it diffuses randomly. And then if they come together, they join up. Okay. Now, what is the steady state of this process? The point is that even if you start with only one crack, as time evolves, the steady state of the system has a finite density of cracks. Because one will be, if there are a few cracks, they will break up. If there are too many cracks, they will merge. And so there is a steady state density of cracks. That steady state density is a function of lambda branching ratio. 
if there is a small branching there will be few cracks right but then what happens in this steady state then it keeps on evolving just like that so the fragmentation pattern in the steady state is independent of initial condition and then you can show that it shows a distribution of sizes uh, which uh, whatever it is what is it that is what you want to determine so the answer is if lambda is very large then there is a um, pattern which is not easy to study but if lambda tends to zero which is a or if lambda is small that is branching ratio is small then the statistics of these clusters is like the statistics of this avalanche clusters in sand piles because the branch does a random work okay until they merge there is only a small bit of correction i have to add due to the fact that oh if this one uh, branches then i am more likely to go in so here the branches is the left branch is more likely to go right because if it if the left boundary is more likely to go right because if it branches then one of the part i will take will be to the right okay so with this minor modification if you study the model then the distribution of fragment sizes can be interpreted in terms of the previous model we have studied so we will leave it at that Uh, actually it turns out that you know you can simulate this in uh, computer and you can look at the pictures of cracks which are already shown in glaciers and the pictures seem to match quite well so it is not an awful model okay so we'll leave it here